My name is Gary Plume. I teach at a medium-sized university in Canada in a, faculty, in a faculty of education. A lot of my work is teaching teachers who are in the Gen Z category, and uh, I teach the, them to teach their students who will also be Gen Z. And I'm going to deviate a little bit. Um, I'm actually not going to focus so much on the digital sphere in my talk. Um, this, might, this presentation might seem a little bit like a now for something completely different kind of presentation. But what it does is I think it'll take a lot of the disparate themes of the conference and help further our thinking in these areas. So what I've done is I've really directed my talk to focus and target on the Gen Z participants. Um, I want to focus on the Gen Z part of the conference more so than the digital literacy part. So what I'm going to do in this talk today is I'm going to make two related but somewhat distinct points. I'm going to speak a little bit about youth, about youth voice, how youth can enter these global conversations that affect their futures by drawing on some examples from my home in Canada. But first, as Dr. Portelli mentioned, I'm going to focus on the theme of this session, which is the education that we need. And I'm going to suggest, I'm going to argue that maybe the education that we need doesn't actually spend that much time in the digital sphere. Right? I was just struck by um, Susie's point in her re response to the last presentation. She wrote a book commenting on Instagram, but she isn't on Instagram, and she talked about resisting these digital spaces. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the educational response to the, the issues that we're dealing with, things like democracy, trustworthiness, critical thinking, relationships, and citizenship, and that we can learn about some of these important principles related to media literacy, through other kinds of pedagogies and learning experiences. So I'm going to talk about these concepts through my experience as an instructor of teacher education courses. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how I built them, how I teach them, and how they challenge traditional ways of teaching. So lectures and conferences are great, I think, but there's other ways of deliberating issues. Um, so I'm going to talk about three courses that I teach here. One is called Democracy in Education. Um, We've talked a lot about the concept of democracy, and yesterday Gutierrez mentioned that the themes of this conf conference are all completely linked to democracy. So in this course, I take a group of students, and on the first day of classes, we sit down and I ask them, so what should we do? And put it back out to the students. We build this class together. We spend the four first classes um, unpacking the courses and designing the course. So we look at the pedagogies, we talk about which texts we should use, which assignments we should uh, use. We have small breakout groups, we use open space technologies, and we deliberate on what we should do. We use this Freirean approach following Brazilian pedagogist Paulo Freire, where we try and blur the lines between teacher and student. So the students effectively become the teachers and the teacher becomes the students. It's very difficult and actually makes a lot of students uncomfortable because it's resisting these typical norms of who students are and teachers are, which are really ingrained in our um, uh, constructs of education. We also look at democratic experiments all over the world, how people and societies ex experimented with the ideal of democracy and why democracies are different in different parts of the world. We look at tensions of democracy, challenges, and we engage in these deep dialogues. So students share their own experiences that influence their, their decisions about the course. So things about democracy you can't do with a check mark on a voting ballot or that you really can't express in a 280 character uh, tweet. The second course I'll talk about um, that I do is a global citizenship education course. And we grapple with this increasingly prominent and pro uh, popular ideal of global citizen and what it means to be a global citizen and, show, and so on. But to nuance this, we try and break out of our sphere. So I partner with a group of students at the Addis Ababa University. And we have conversations together. We ask the same questions, questions like, what does a day in your life look like? What does it mean to have a global perspective? What actions can we take to imagine a better global future? And the way we answer these questions is by finding photos or taking photos and sharing these conversations with photos. So students collect photos from the internet, we share them on Jamboard, 
And um, through that Jamboard, they tell their stories. And what happens in this course is people tell deep stories that eventually get to these themes of global citizenship and how it differs across uh, venues. One student said after the course that it didn't really feel like learning. We were just getting together to tell stories. So there's different ways of, I think, approaching these ideals. The last course I'll talk about is a land-based education course. And this course is built on the theory that we can't really understand the world around us if we don't know our own place, if we don't know the land and environment that we come from. So in this course, we spend two weeks every day. We're out hiking and biking and paddling through our region uh, to learn about our place through land. Yesterday, Dr. Bartello spoke about us being as nomads and said that we've lost our bearings. And I would agree with that. And if we don't really know our connection to the place that we live in, that we call home, we can't really make sense of the world around us. So in this course, we learn about the histories, the cultures, the politics of our region, but everything is predicated on the environment. So how the flora, fauna, climate, geography shape our culture, the aspects of shared histories that we have in Canada, um, the various empires that have dominated our country. So, for example, we unpack the legacies of, the, of British colonization in our country. Um, this might be a similar exercise in Malta to unpack the, the various empires and so on. One of our key assignments is to find the name of a town that we pass through and try and figure out why is it named that? Which language does it come from? Why is it named as such? Who named it? Who has been overlooked? And so on. Um, this might be another interesting exercise in Malta, too, for students here. Valletta, Medina, Victoria. Where do these names come from, and who do they represent, and who do they not represent? So all this to say, some of the themes in this um, is that we might unwire to learn about online phenomena. So democracy depends on trustworthiness, for example. A certain amount of transparency. So one thing I argue here is global is important, but so is local. Like, so is local understanding. We can't really make sense of the global events that we're seeing on our media if we don't know who we are and deeply understand our own home and our own perspectives, our own biases. Wired is great, but so is offline, right? Some things we learn better on offline. The earliest World Wide Web was the one that existed beneath us and around the Earth, right? The incredibly vast community of interconnected forests and plants, of fungi and animals, this hidden matrix in our world. Um, formal education is important, what we learn at schools and in the construct of schools, but also informal learning, right? So sharing stories, conversations, these are learning too. Understanding lived experiences. And finally, <clears throat> Um, critical perspectives are important, especially when we're learning the power and the manipulation of algorithms, for example, um, of media. But as we've said, much of it is overwhelming, and the antidote to grief is hope, some of this criticality. The second point I wanted to make, which is related to this, is how young people can have a say in our societies and in these courses. So all of these courses, one thing they had in common is that they're either driven by young people in one way or another, um, either in the voice of the courses, suggestions for the course, and so on. So this um, theme that's permeated through this conference, I think, is about young people and how they can have power. And I'm going to share a few examples in of things that have emerged in Canada in the past few years. So one is the idea of young people claiming the stage as individual champions of a particular cause. So, you know, your Malala or Greta Thunberg, for example. This is Autumn Pelche, who's from uh, the Wikwemakon First Nation, which is near my home, who um, in their First Nation participate in water ceremonies, a traditional water ceremony, and ask the question, why are there signs everywhere about boil water advisories or toxic water, which is common amongst First Nations in Canada, and began to uh, advocate for clean water in their nations and so on. So here she is on the right addressing the UN for this, um, uh, for this cause um, and, uh, and speaking towards a cause as a champion of this. Another way that I would propose that youth can have action and power is in small groups 
right? So in this one here, this is a group of young people advocating against climate change, change uh, climate change policy in Ontario, where I'm from. Um, so when the government changed in our, in our um, province, um, they relaxed some of the laws around emissions. And these, this small group of youth here actually took the government to court um, and suggested that this new law failed to protect youth and future generations. So they're actually at the provincial superior court right now um, in this one. This is an organization I used to be an adult ally for. Uh, it's a government-funded organization of a group of about 40 Gen Z youth that meet and identify topics of concern and then learn to write policy on these issues. So they attend workshops about how to draft policy and how to seek seats at policy-making tables. And then finally, sort of the largest sphere, so we're going from smaller to larger, are big groups. This is a group in Quebec of Quebec students, and it's a mass demonstration about tuition fees, which might resonate with people here. Um, but in Canada, we pay for uh, university and college education, and the government just doubled the tuition fee. Um, it would raise fees by almost double, which excluded a lot of students. So about half the province's students went on strike, about a quarter of a million students um, that you saw in, in, this, in this picture here. So here's some takeaways, six thoughts here um, about voice and power. Bjorn just mentioned in the last se se uh, session that it is all about power and spaces. And so how can youth have power? So here are thoughts that I'll propose. So one is to find existing spaces provided for youth. So recognizing where spaces are provided. Um, a lot of adults talk <laughs> the rhetoric of wanting youth to have voice. So youth need to press adults on that. And oftentimes there are seats held on decision-making tables for youth. So you can find out where those are. And if not, we can ask to to uh, have those seats. Um, that youth can partner with adult allies, right? Somebody in the manifesto said, we are not in power yet, you are in power, right? But there are adults out there that look for ways that are um, open to um, transferring this power to youth. So um, these adults that are willing to share or give that up, give that, up, give that power up, um, find them and ally with them. Organizing is a key thing, I would suggest. So even if it's small group organizing, right? even if it's a few others, sometimes we think organizing is daunting, but I'm inspired by this quote by Margaret Mead, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. So small groups, as you've seen through some of these examples in Canada, can be quite powerful. Um, and even if it's one or two, um, an organized group, can be more impactful than an indiv individual. Clear, consistent messaging, a single cause, a brand, like the examples I gave from you, Autumn Pelletier around water, uh, or, um, or for example, the climate crisis. Learning to read and write policy is a valuable skill as well. Um, I gave you an example, but this literacy can also help challenge policy or regulations of corporations, for example, that we've learned about earlier today. And then finally, um, oh, I don't have the last one. The last one was to be patient, um, which can be hard because oftentimes we expect change to happen immediately. But we could also set the conditions for change and change could happen later. Right? Um, Tolstoy said, the two most, most powerful warriors are patience and time. Um, so I'm looking for Jeanette. I don't see Jeanette. My manifesto suggestion, which is not in the slide here, was to save spaces at every decision-making table for youth. So I will convey that to her later. And I wanted to end with another project that I'm working on as an, as an example, and I'll just put it out to, to people. I work on a global project for youth and with youth across Commonwealth countries, small countries in, in Southern Africa, uh, in the Pacific, in the Caribbean. And many of these youth in these small countries 
don't have this information uh, or knowledge about disinformation that we've learned over the past couple days. I would say we've learned a lot here. And what I wanted to invite people to do is if you are a Gen Z here and you'd like to share what you've learned at this conference with other youth in different spheres of the world um, in an online platform that you would be credited for, um, come talk to me and uh, I'll let you know a little bit more about that project for youth. So thank you very much.